It's good to see all of you on this uh, beautiful, crisp <laughs> Christmas Eve. I kind of like it, actually. It's a, it's a nice break. And I'm sure it will be snowing <laughs> when we leave. Pray with me. Gracious God, on this holy night, we pray that somehow your spirit might descend upon us once more. That in the midst of the glitter and the clatter and the noise and the hustle and the bustle and the pace of our everyday lives, we can somehow center, at least for a while, long enough for our hearts to crack open and your light to shine in. That the Christ might be born, that the spirit of the one who came for peace and died for our souls might touch us, that we, like the wise men, might leave this time in this place going home a different way. And so we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of every heart here be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. You know, public speaking of any kind, whether to a small group, a large group, a church group, or another, public speaking is based upon knowing your audience. And by preaching uh, to a relatively, albeit seasonal, constituency for a number of years here at the beach, I would say that I pretty well know my congregation. But you know, Christmas Eve throws it all in the air. It's always different on Christmas Eve because churches play musical worship. You know, my people go somewhere else, somebody else's people come here, and we just kind of swap around, given, given, you know, whatever is going on in our personal lives and in our families. And so there's always a challenge to think about that, because, you know, in some ways, preaching is like counseling on a large scale. I mean, there's a lot of people here with a lot of different needs and a lot of uh, variations in their expectations, and we hope that we meet at least some of them. But the question is, with this mix of Christmas Eve, this season, what is it that you have in common? I mean, what is it that one would address that <coughs> would speak to people from the West, the North, the East, the South, Tampa, or here on the beach. And so, in, you know, we all share the same genetic characteristics, and we all have the same basic human needs, so I would assume we have something in common to address. So I did my homework, you know, I Googled, like everybody in the world. I Googled what was the greatest concern, the most significant emotion that Americans had in the year 2022. What was it? What did we all have in common, no matter where we lived or where we came from? And what I discovered is survey after survey revealed that the majority of us live in a constant state of fear. We may not be conscious of it every moment, but we are told and people admit that it is there. You know, we have a fear of inflation these days. We have a fear of a world war. We have fear of random attacks or shootings involving ourselves, our family, our friends. We have a fear of a declining environment, a deceptive government, the rising cost of health care. Maybe on a personal level we have the fear of being laid off, losing a job, or losing a marriage. Now, I'm not going to try to deny or justify or in any way attempt to 
analyze any of the things I have mentioned or the surveys raised up, but I do know that all of these variations, no matter where you come from, how you think, what, what you're going through in your life or in your communities, they all cluster un under the umbrella of a society ill at ease with itself. A country composed not so much of the free and the brave as the free and the afraid. Afraid of those who are other in body, mind, theology, ideology. Afraid of a world that is transforming faster than we can keep up. And you know, when we are afraid, when people become fearful, I don't know about you, but we do crazy stuff. We do crazy stuff. And often people react in over the top ways that, you know, they're single acts, but they drag us all down. They pull us all down into that rabbit hole where sense and sensibility go dark in words as well as actions. Actions and words once considered way out of bounds. Words that are hurtful and destructive are suddenly common and normalized. And when this happens, we exponentially nurture an atmosphere where negativity thrives at the expense of what? Hope. Hope. You know, courage may enable us, we're always called to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and just tough it out. You know, courage may enable us to rise above our fears, but I tell you, it is hope that empowers us to engage our fears to begin with. And I have said many times, for most people, it is the start that stops them. And there is no start without hope. Now you may be thinking, okay, the guy's a Debbie Downer. I get it. I get it. Christmas is about joy. It's about love. It's about a host of good stuff. But not to the neglect of the reality to the point where we make all that we talk about and all we think about and all this theology from ages past that we try to make relevant for today, not at the price of turning it into fantasy. Fantasy and make-believe. When in fact, Christmas tells us that it is into the real, it is down into the, you know, the, God comes down into the dirtiness of our world a stable to exist with us, to share with us, to help us and encourage us and, and to guide us, not above or beyond or outside. It is not that kind of a faith. It is a kind of faith that says it makes a difference in the world or it does nothing at all. You know, a stable. <laughs> you ever think about a stable? You ever been on a farm? You ever been in a stable? place lined with animals and all the stuff that comes with them? It's not exactly, it's not exactly the place most of us would want to hang out. But it is symbolic of a world in need of help. A humanity pleading for a savior who will help, a savior who we say came the Savior came not to eliminate the sources of our fears, but to assure us that whatever we are afraid of need not, need not possess us or rule over us unless we allow it to. You know, we forget amid all our festivities, the songs, the singing, the dancing, the jocularity, we forget that fear is the ribbon that wraps every character in the Christmas narrative. It's that theme that goes all the way through the story. 
14 years old, Mary finds herself pregnant, unwed. You can't tell me she wasn't afraid. She lived in a society where a woman in her condition would be put out, shunned, shut out, ostracized, maybe even stoned to death. How could she not be afraid? And when we read of Joseph, Joseph uh, learns of her pregnancy. He too is afraid, but he's afraid in a different way. You know, Joseph's afraid. What, what will people say? What will people think about me, about her? You know, my life is on a downhill from, from now on. So what's Joseph decide to do? He says, well, I'll kind of put her aside quietly. And in time, people will, they'll forget, they'll get over it. But he too, like Mary, is encouraged by a nighttime visitor who says, I know what's going on in your life. I, I see that. That's the real stuff that exists with humanity. But Joseph, Mary, don't forget that God is at work. God is at work through all manner of people, events, and avenues, most of which we are unaware of. The underground, the backstage, the out of sight, the beyond the scope of our intellect and power. So I tell you, fear not. Fear not. And then, too, the least of the least and the last of the lost, the shepherds. You know, there were no astrophysicist Ivy Leaguers in that group, let me tell you. But just about the time they settle down for the night, their sky lights up in song and in dance. And, you know, have you ever been sound asleep and woke up? You, you kind of startled and you jump up. And I don't know about you, but... There's a little bit of fear that comes with that till you get your senses, and so they jump up, and what are they told in that moment? Fear not. You do not have to understand it all. This God who comes, comes for the world as it is, as you are, who you are, what you have to offer, what you with the divine can do. So you see, fear is not new. It was front and center at the first Christmas. But what seems apparent to me is that the danger in this, when we try to think through our fears and how to handle things that are maybe a little frightening in our lives, the danger lies not in the instinct of fear itself, for there are times when it is appropriate and necessary to be afraid. But when we have that emotion, the danger lies when we don't think about who or what is originating it and where they want to lead us or take us. What is the end of these things and these people who wish to frighten us? Who are we listening to and why do we give them power over us? You know, there's so many, so many in the world these days who want us to be afraid. Why? So they can manipulate us people seeking power or seeking to hold their power, using fear to push us to their ends. You know, sell, sell, sell. Well, behind the scenes, they're buying, 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 right? It's the tool of choice. And social media makes it so accessible and effective. However, it can only work in correlation to the time, the space, and the credibility that we give it. The credibility we give it to green light our minds, invade our spirits, causing us to believe that our only response to fear is the primitive one of fight or flight. And I tell you that into this maryless go round perception comes the voice of this evening, the voice of this season, the voice of reason who says, believe and fear not. You know, those words, those two words mean a lot. Maybe not to everyone, but I know they mean a lot to a few people. Those words mean a lot to people who believe in causes that are greater than me and mine. I win, so everybody else must lose. 
those people who revealed that they, you know, they overcame their fears when they worked tirelessly to protect and to care for us during the pandemic. It is evident in those who risk their personhood to speak out against sense, the senseless violence of our age rather than just keeping numb. They speak out against it. The violence that in word as well as deed damages children's mind, ends complete strangers' lives, and limits no, I tell you, it incarcerates the spirits of young and old by preaching that to believe in anyone or anyone who says something different is not just wrong, but evil. Those who would justify, those, those who would justify inaction by saying, well, you know, it is what it is, but instead march to a different drummer and sing to an alternative tune, and they say to all the rest of the world, join us. Let's dance. Let's dance. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, the person who is not conquering some fear every day has not learned the secret of life. The person who is not conquering some fear every day has not learned the secret of life. You see, despite some loud voices who would have us believe that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, I tell you it isn't, so long as we don't give them our handbaskets. In fact, our world has come a long way. If you step back and look at history, it has come a long way. I was reading the other day that poverty is at an all-time low worldwide. Our world has come a long way since that first Christmas, which doesn't mean there aren't monstrous dragons waiting in the shadows to be slain, but it does mean that because of those who came before us, those who refused to surrender to the fears of their times, hope still stands. Christmas still comes. Church bells still ring, and the last sentence of life is yet to be written, the final sonnet, sonnet yet to be sung. It's Christmas Eve, and Christmas is upon us. Christmas is upon us to lift our spirits and embolden our souls and strengthen our hearts, reminding us that we still can sing, we still have voices capable of singing peace on earth and joy to all people. Though dark and cold the night may be, I tell you God is not done and the story has not yet ended. And the spark that would ignite a flame to burn beyond this season for the fact that some still come, that spark still glows. So as you leave, tonight to go wherever you will, I encourage you to take with you two words. Not Merry Christmas. You can use that, but that's not, that's not the one I got underlined here. But rather the words that I think all of us desperately need to hear. I really do the words we desperately need to hear, fear not, fear not. Because if we say those and we take those with us, we might just be surprised how our outlook on life and our perception of the world is changed. Fear not.